Hey guys, welcome to the show. Uh, today in the show I have Perrin Carroll. Uh, he's on the show today to talk a little bit about niche sites and building out niche sites. Uh, welcome to the show, Perrin. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Uh, thanks for taking your time off, uh, you know, Friday night here. <laughs> but um, do you want to talk a little bit about your story? You know, how you got started with, uh, you know, I guess the world of entrepreneurship. Yeah, sure. Man, where to begin? Um, I guess my story starts in 2011 in August when I got hired by Towers Watson, who was a really big global consulting firm. Um, this is right after I graduated with my MFA in poetry. And if you've never gotten a poetry degree, you're basically terrified the whole time that you are never going to get a job in your whole life. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so I got this job at a global consulting firm, basically writing communications for really big companies. And I was super stoked because it was way more money than I ever thought I would make in my life. And it was a steady job, and I was working with a bunch of writers, and I thought it was awesome. And that honeymoon phase lasted for like three months before I realized that I just totally hated it. I hated mm -hmm. being in a cubicle. I hated getting up uh, and going to work every day. I hated having this like massive hierarchy of bosses who were breathing down my neck and basically looking for reasons to get me in trouble and that sort of thing, you know? Um, so, like, months after I got hired, I started looking for a way out. And that was um, just, like, reading books and thinking about entrepreneurship for the first time in, in my life as, like, a serious career, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, selling something to people. So I was uh, exploring lots of different things, you know, and during that time I failed at a lot of different things. I tried to be a dating coach at one point. <laughs> um, I tried to build a couple websites. I tried to create some software, and um, none of it worked, but that was okay because when you're doing entrepreneurship, uh, one of the best things you can do, I think, is to just fail as many times as it takes to succeed. So in that process, I stumbled on some SEO blogs, and um, one of them was like the SEO subreddit on, on Reddit and, you know, Pat Flynn's blog and Neil Patel's blog. And, of course, one of them was Spencer's blog. So I, w I was reading Spencer's blog and following along and trying to create my own niche sites and failing. And um, eventually Spencer had a contest to take on a student. So he had done a big niche site project, which was basically a public case study. And he decided to do another one, another public case study, but this time he would take on a student. And he essentially held a contest where he chose like a dozen people at random, and then everybody kind of wrote a little blurb for themselves and, um, uh, you know, put it on his blog, and everybody voted, and I ended up winning that. Yeah, so I that was... I actually applied to that as well. So. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so I was I was pretty lucky. I mean, I was lucky to be one of the finalists, and then I like to think that my amazing writing carried me through to the finish. But definitely a huge element of luck there, and it was of a fun process. But um, so after that, I met Spencer, and we started the project, and it was really a super fun process, but incredibly difficult too, because I was coming into SEO basically green, and I didn't know anything about it, so, um, and and we were doing it live. So in addition to just learning about websites and SEO, um, I, we were documenting the whole thing and making video podcast, and uh, you know I was recording all my questions and that sort of thing. So it was a basically a really big process that started in September of last year, um, and around December the website started to earn a little bit of money. I think in December it earned, um, no, in November it earned like $38. So that was three months after the website started, September, October, November. Excuse me. Um, and then December with the Christmas push, I earned, I think, $600. And then in January I earned $1,300, and it's gone up from there until um, the site got to like $2,000 in monthly earnings. I think this month I'm on track for $3,000 in monthly earnings. Wow. 
And during that time, of course, I was learning a whole bunch. I um, was creating other niche sites for myself that are starting to earn a little bit of money, and also I have a, a uh, software business that I've been trying to start for a really long time that I ended up getting off the ground. Um, and of course, like after developing our professional relationship, Spencer and I decided that we would like to partner full-time, so he hired me as an employee for his business. So it was a really exciting journey. You know, I went from basically hating my job to getting lucky and winning a contest to learning a whole bunch and uh, creating a really successful website. And um, now I'm sitting here talking to you, having made a bunch of friends in the internet marketing community. Yeah, and yeah. I got about a million projects going, and I'm you know making more money than I ever have in my life, which is just a really, really fun place to be, especially with a poetry degree. Yeah, I mean, I've found, like, ever since I got on this kind of, like, the whole idea of just blogging or the idea of being able to really, like, see that there's no limit as to what you could really do when it comes to making a little bit of extra money online... You know, it's like it's like so motivating. Like you just want to keep going with it. Yeah, and it's you know it's a really weird field. And before you make that first dollar, it seems impossible. Like not only to you, but to everybody around you. I mean, I mean, I remember when, when I was like telling people about it. Like I think I'm gonna try making a website and like selling some ad space on it, and everybody goes. Pfft. You know, like, yeah. like that's gonna work. Like, get a job. You know, so it's it's uh, it's really fun to actually see that first dollar come in and to, you know, watch this like little thing that you've created grow into something that's an actual business. Yeah, it, it's so funny you say that. And I thought I'd mention this for anyone listening. You know, if you, um, I went over. You know, I'm a pretty avid gamer. I know you are yourself because that's yeah, one definitely. of your software pieces on, but. Um, to give it like an example, I, and this is great because it's really kind of in line with what we're talking about. I um, right around the time Guild Wars 2 was pretty popular. It was like a new MMO. You know, this was like a few months back. Uh, I went over a buddy's house. I brought my laptop, and while we were like waiting for something, like I think something was loading, I just alt tabbed and I started watching YouTube videos of Derek Halpern from Social Triggers. Uh -huh. And my buddies turned around and they were like, "Oh, you got to stop listening to that crap." And you know, give that you know, give that stuff up, and they were just so <laughs> negative. And I actually, I um, like a little while after, Derek actually um, posted something on his blog that was like asking for a question, pretty much about something where he could, you know, share a story or write a blog on something. And I I shared that with him in a comment, and he wrote an entire blog post about um, your friends not believing in in what you're doing in your online avenues, and. All my other friends, you know, they knew yeah. me because I was doing, like, MLM marketing yeah. for a couple of years, and so they were always, like, pushing that whole, like, pyramid scheme conversation on me. So I still, even even as of, like, right. past month, like, I finally have, like, hit some success with my own, you know, like, SEO service, and they're, fi they're kind of like, oh, well, congrats, you know, but they just, like, they can't yeah. really like, say it anymore, you know? So it, it just it, it's kind of a good feeling to finally like push it back at them, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. it is. It's fun. It's fun in, in in like a playful way, you know. And like I have a couple friends who have been like super negative about it, and now that they see it's working, now they want to do it, you know. And I yeah, think that's just a product of most people being risk averse. You know, like yeah. people don't, don't like to take a risk, and I think it takes a very specific type of personality to do this SEO, this weird world of SEO. You know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, there's so much to learn, and you know, I think if I was having a friend jump in with me now, it would be, you know, like I mean, I even tried to get my girlfriend. I know we mentioned bef like before we started the show, like I have a skull clothing site is my niche site, and that's like a uh, literally I started that because my girlfriend. I wanted to do something where I could work on it with my girlfriend and like kind of yeah. have her be a part of it. So right. she was the one who put all the products on the site, you know. Yeah. So it was, you know, yeah. easy way to work together on something. Yeah, totally. But um, do you want to talk a little bit about? I mean, obviously, I know we could make it like an entire easy like 
I'm sure it could be hours just talking about some of the things that you've done to like really help your site like monetize it and um, how you've been able to really start ranking and bringing in a lot of traffic and getting buyers. Um, I'm trying to think like what really we could talk about that would interest people. I know, um, I mean, like what are some of the main things you're really doing like that you're seeing the most success from? I mean, obviously, I notice when I look at your site and something I don't see with every niche site is that you have tons of these articles that are really well written and they're like on very specific topics and very specific titles. Yeah, so uh, the content might be a good place to start because that was basically the only professional level skill that I brought into site building was writing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, writing, and be, be, before I started doing SEO, I had been writing professionally for like five years. Um, and when I started like building a site, I was writing for big corporations, McDonald's, Harley Davidson, Coca-Cola, like those, like that level, you know? So. Wow. So I kind of have always known how to write, um, but very few people really bring that quality to any niche site, um, or at least they weren't like a year ago. Lots of people will outsource their niche site writing or um, just buy articles in bulk, and sometimes that's fine if you find a good service, but... One of the reasons I think a penny shaved converts so well, and it really does, about half of my traffic clicks through to Amazon, is that I spent a lot of time on my first base of articles, mm -hmm. um, of uh, 15 articles. Like, the primary article is 2,000 words. I spent, like, a full day on it, and I revised it very carefully, thought about where I was putting my Amazon links based on, like, what I knew about... Where's to be, where people's eyes were going to be on the page and like that sort of thing my that I learned in my communications background. Um, and then after it started earning money, I didn't want to personally spend any more time writing on the site because I had so much other SEO stuff going on. Sure. But I knew oh, the quality was important. So I hired uh, my brother, who's also a good writer, um, to do all the articles by hand. And so that does a couple of things. First is like it gives the site a really consistent voice. Um, if there's somebody who knows what they're doing, then you can just count on the quality instead of having to like spend time editing. And also, like when you have really quality content with a really snappy voice, um, people will be drawn to that personality. And so, like instead of just going there to find information, they're going to relate to the voice that's writing this piece, um, which makes them much more likely to come back and much more likely to take an action on the site. So. Um, I think it's really worth it. I mean, the argument against it is that you're paying a premium price for content on a site that you might not know works. Um, and to that I would say that, you know, you're not spending very much money anyway until you know the site is already earning, or at least I don't pay for content until I know a site is earning. And, um, you know, what you're paying for is about six or seven hundred dollars worth of content. But if that's going to make you a thousand more dollars a month than you might normally make, um, then it's obviously worth it to me. So the content sure. was definitely yeah. central to to the success of a penny shaved. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you guys have tons of articles. They're really in depth. I haven't read through like all of them, but I have, you know, read through several of them. Yeah. I mean, I was curious too. I know, um, I know, you know, and I've used him as well. I think. Um, Lee Smallwood of gradsavers.com has mentioned that you guys have done, um, you know, some articles with with the Grad Savers team, which are basically um, college graduates that are looking for work to help pay off their student debt. Um, yep. They have that system set up where it's like a credit, you know, point system. Someone could do a blog article for whatever amount of points, 500 points. They turn that into five dollars, and then it pays off some of their student debt. Um, for those of you who don't know, but um. How, I mean, have you used that site quite a bit? I mean, I've found the content that he, that his team can produce is, like, really phenomenal in comparison to, say, going out and finding someone from, like, another country to write your content for, you know, a few dollars here and there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I do sometimes. So if I do go with a service, it's usually grad savers because, like you said, they're all college-educated people yep. who um, will write good content with good grammar a lot of times it's funny and like that's a really good thing. The reason that I have moved away from that and I still use them. Um, in fact, I'm getting ready to order a 
dispatch from them a little bit later. Um, but the reason that I've moved away from it is that I really like my sites to have a singular voice mm. because I feel like it's more identifiable to the reader. So nowadays, I have like six freelancers that I basically pay the same rate that I would pay grad savers. Um, so they make a little bit more money, takes out the middleman, and I just give one person you know, all the articles for one site and just kind of let them post them as, as they come through um, so that, like, they know what the site's about as they research to get more and more familiar with the content and, um, you know, they just have fun with that one site, whatever it is. So it depends, like, sometimes I, I, I'll just need, like, a big batch of really good articles and that's kind of what I use Grad Savers for. But if I'm adding content to only one site, I usually try to just freelance one really good person um, hmm. using the sort of like social media hiring strategy that I developed when I was looking for writers when Spencer first hired me. Now, where are you sourcing a lot of these writers? Are you on like sites like Odesk or iWriter, Text Broker, something like that, or is it elsewhere? Um, it is elsewhere. It's my own networks. So I post a quote-unquote ad if I'm trying to find writers, I will post a quote-unquote ad on my social media networks and, you know, say, like, are there any writers out there looking for a part-time job? Do you know any writers looking for a part-time job? It's about 200 bucks a week or whatever I'm going to be paying or the project's going to be a $600 project. Does anybody want it? And, like, what most people don't realize is, like, just like everybody knows a graphic designer, everybody knows a writer. Or there are writers out there who need work. I mean, I know so many writers who are literally doing work for free just to build their resume sure. that they would jump at the chance to earn 20 bucks writing a thousand word article on whatever. So right. um, let's see. I've hired two of my former students. I've hired my dad's old secretary. I've hired my own brother. I've hired my old philosophy professor's wife. Um, so, I mean, just like a, a really wide range of people that you find on Facebook, you know, but all people who, like, I know personally who can contact me on the phone or Facebook at any time if they have questions, who, like, are smart people and uh, who just, like, want a little bit of extra money. So, hmm. um, usually that works pretty well for me. And uh, now... Like, having worked with all those people at one time or another, when I do have a project where, like, you know, we have a website and we need to fill it with 20 pages of content, uh, I can sort of run down the list and say, like, hey, do you want this work? Do you want this work? And then somebody's going to say yes. And then I just give them the assignment. They know how I work. They know what I expect. And then, you know, in two weeks or whatever, I just get back 13 great articles, which is kind of ideal when you are right. um, managing several sites. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's really interesting. I know um, one place, I don't know if you've ever looked there, but I think it's, I want to say it's the Pro Blogger job boards. I yeah. think it is. That has a lot of like people that are like looking, basically others hiring for writing jobs. So I've considered if I ever need it, I might even go over there myself. Yeah, that's a good place. Um, the Reddit for Hire is a really, a really good place. Uh, I like I've had absolutely no luck with Odesk and um, Elance, mm -hmm. and what I decided a long time ago is that I make so much more money paying a premium price for writing than I would if I was like skimping on the writing. Sure. Um, so I have no problem hiring somebody on Reddit for hire. Like, my view is that you know it's a marginally or a marginal increase in upfront costs for. A massive increase in profits later. Right, you're you're really getting a good ROI, basically. Yeah, it's just good business. Yeah. Now, um, I know obviously, like, I guess when it comes to like niche site building, you know, I've I've done a little myself, and my sites like really haven't been all that successful. But I don't spend a ton of time with them. Like, it sounds like you really invested a ton of time into these sites, and like it's really been almost like a at this point, it sounds like almost a full time thing. Like you can dedicate a lot of time. Um. I did want to ask, you know, when it comes to obviously design and click-through rates, I mean, I think that's like really a whole other conversation, but, you know, what a big thing would be was um, the keyword research, you know, kind of figuring out what it is you're going to write about and what it is you're going to be targeting. I mean, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. So I think I wrote in the blog post on Niche Pursuits where we were wrapping up the project for Penny Shaved. Mm -hmm. um, 
I wrote that like basically everything about SEO is going to change constantly. Linking strategies are going to change. Google is going to change its algorithms. On-page optimization is going to change. The one thing that's probably going to stay the same for a really long time is keyword research. So it has been, it is, and it will be the cornerstone of any great niche site. And um, it's certainly the place where I invest the most upfront work um, when I'm creating a, a, a new niche site. So sort of the, the keys to finding a great keyword is to, and I, I'm going to try to do this without talking specifically about Longtail Pro, even though that's a really great tool that I know a lot of people use and that I use, but the key to finding a really good keyword to sort of build a site around is like first um, that it's in a good market, and that means, and, and that's something that I basically ignored for a long time um, and was one of the keys to success for Penny Shave that I really just stumbled on. Um, but that, that I didn't necessarily know. But you want to pick something that's in a good market. So what's a good market? That's going to be something, obviously, where people are spending money. So that means um, something where there's either fear or a pain point, like skincare or um, dieting or financial or something, you know. Um, or it's going to be a place where people really enjoy spending money, like a hobby, which is what a penny shaved was, because there's a massive community of people who have shaving as a hobby. Um, or just a really great consumer product where there's a lot of money being spent, you know? So gardening, that sort of thing, you know, like baby right. stuff, pet stuff. Um, so I usually don't start with the market as because they're – and, I mean, there are ways to, like, start with the market and then do keyword research for that market. Um, but it's definitely something that I'm thinking about when I'm going through my ideas for keywords. So having a good market is something that you want to see. You want to see that it's low competition. So if you have Longtail Pro, there's a really easy way to do that with the with the keyword competitiveness and metric. But if you don't, you basically want to make sure that the, like, sites in the top ten of Google are have a PA of less than 30 at least, or like the average PA page authority is less than 30. And lastly, one of the key things that I, that I look for when I'm looking for a good keyword is that there are already niche sites ranking. And that seems counterintuitive to a lot of people. A lot of people will see a niche site ranking and not want to go for the keyword because they feel like they're competing with somebody. Sure. Um, but if you see other niche sites in the top 10, and especially if you see niche sites in the top one, two, or three spots, you know Google is happy to rank that type of site for that keyword, which is a really good sign. It's like when Burger King builds a restaurant across the street from McDonald's. They know that places or that, that location works, so um, they know they're going to make money there. So that's sure. kind of the, the, the same thing, and I'm a lot less lenient with like secondary keywords, but that's sort of the basics of um, what makes a good keyword for me. Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, great information. I know, um, you know, for those of you who don't who don't know about it, Longtail Pro is basically a keyword research tool, which I actually recently picked up myself. I had tried the trial a while back, and because of all the success that um, one of my fellow entrepreneurs, Matt Allen, was having with it, um, that's actually I found him because I was researching keyword research tools, and he yeah. wrote a post comparing Longtail Pro to I think it was Market Samurai. Right. And I found his blog and then sort of fell into the chain of all these other people, like probably how I ended up meeting you and all these other folks, like throughout all these blogs. Right. Kinda, everybody sort of knows each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a small world for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that, that, that's great advice. Um, I know definitely if, you know, if anyone's interested in starting a niche site, you know, you're going to have to put up content. I know I've seen people, I actually built a site for a guy um, I think I charged him a little low. I, I, I built a guy's site for $200 um, using a plugin called Pro Associate, which basically allows you to put in products and then um, add them to your cart and it immediately brings you into Amazon. Yeah. Very seamless. But he hasn't put any content on the site like whatsoever. Um, and I noticed, I went on there the other day and I saw that he changed the whole theme around. And I think he was assuming that maybe, I don't know, like he wasn't doing well because the theme just wasn't converting well. 
Yeah. But if you don't have content, then how is how is anyone ever going to find you? Yeah, totally. So, you know, that was why I thought we'd talk about it because it definitely is really important. And I know, you know, the folks I've seen, I don't know if you had ever seen, um, I don't know if you follow Tongue Tran of Cloud Income. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, he had done um, a site way back called bestadjustabledumbbells.org. Yeah, I remember. Yeah, he sold yeah, it and, like ten grand. Yeah, the guy sold the site for ten thousand dollars, and um, that site was making him around seven hundred, I think, to a thousand dollars a month. And the homepage is just so well written. I mean, it was like a two thousand word article comparing these dumbbells. You know, super content rich. Yep. Like you know, that's that's basically what what what's really going to bring the success when it comes to like making one of these sites. I've noticed is the people who are having the most success have really really good content. Yep, yep, it's totally true. I mean, when you think about it, when people are looking for information um, and they land on your site, it's basically a sales page. But with a blog, people expect to just find tons of great information. And mm. so the longer they're on the site um, and you know you keep them on the page with great content, the more likely they are going to to uh, take action. Sure. So uh, do you want to share, like, I guess, any other tips, like, you could think of offhand, maybe in terms of, like, building out the sites, things that might not, not be quite as obvious? Um, I know um, one big thing that, obviously, everybody, I'm sure, struggles with is link building. Yep. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? I know, um, like, we talked before we started that you're, um, you're sort of, um, you, you've had a lot of success using private blog networks. Yeah. Yeah, so link building is always going to be tricky. It's something that changes all the time. Um, so Spencer has done two public case studies on nichepursuits.com, and the first one, um, the first one's link building phase was totally different than mine. So the first one, he just bought one link building package for 200 bucks, and that was it. He did some light blog comments, but basically he just pushed by, you know, right? The link building for a penny shaved was considerably more in depth because Google's algorithms change and you know it's it gets harder all the time. So um, as I build sites in the future, I am constantly changing my strategies and, and trying to adapt to what's working right now, um, and that's kind of tough. So what worked for so maybe it, it, it makes sense to talk about what, what worked for a penny shaved and then what I feel is working right now. So sure. what worked for a penny shaved um, was a combination of two things. So for any site, you need a base of links to get a variety of IPs pointing at your website. And I did that through blog comments. And you can find any blog comment package anywhere. I recommend the ones from SEO Genius. They do a really great job. They find relevant blogs, and that's kind of what I use for all my sites. Um, after that, I bought private blog network links on Rank Hero, and not a lot. Um, I bought, I think, five to start. And if you don't know what a PBN is, it's basically a privately controlled network of blogs with really high authority built on very old domains. And when you put a link on there, it gives you a high-powered link back to your site. Um, and the third component was basically networking and hustling. So I found, I think, a, um, a list of... I didn't find it. I actually researched all these. But I put together a list of high-authority blogs in the shaving niche, and then I created a resources page on my site, and then I basically used Flattery to start a conversation with those webmasters. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say, like, hey, I added you to my resources page. I think you have a great site. Um, just wanted to let you know that. And then if they emailed me back and said, hey, thanks, that's really nice of you, I would say, you know, great, yeah, do you guys, like, take guest posts or whatever? And I, I got, um, like, maybe five really like fantastic links like on very high authority sites that were super relevant in my in, in my niche mm -hmm. um, so with the combination of those three things like a like a, just a flat base of links a few high quality links that I bought on a private blog network and then some networking to get links on sites that I basically made just by making friends with people sure um, that over the course of you know three months or so, Really helped. That really helped a penny shaved. 
like sort of rise in the SERPs. And when it dipped, I just added more private blog network links. So that w that's what worked for a penny shaved. What I think works now is um, using a combination of a couple things. But the parts are basically the same. So when I'm building a site now, I like to have a strong base of links on really relevant sites. And you can do that in a number of ways. You can do that by hiring a service to create 2.0s in your niche. You can do it with blog comments, which is what I usually do. Um, there are a whole bunch of different ways to do it. But you basically want, or press releases, which is another thing that I use, which like they don't give you great do follow links like a PBN would, but they sure. give lots of links on a lot of different sites pointing back to your site. After that, I like to have sort of a layer of links on mid-range PBM blogs. So think like PA 20s and 30s with partial match anchor text um, just to sort of get the authority flowing and simulate in a really rough way the path like viral content might take. And then after that, I usually like to finish it, out, finish it off with five or ten really strong exact match anchor, anchor links on very authoritative sites. Um, so that's kind of what's, what's working right now. There are lots of different ways to do it. Like every site is an experiment. That's sort of a mix between white hat and, and like gray hat techniques um, that still give you like a lot of longevity. People like John Cooper have really great methods for like total white hat link building using like broken links and Wikipedia links and directories and things like that. Sure. Um, but I choose to spend money instead of time in in a lot of the cases. So. Right. And, yeah. I'm, I mean, it is very difficult. I mean, even even with the um, like recent announcement from. Um, the head of uh, web spam of Google, you know, Matt Cutts, he mentioned the whole thing about how guest blogging has become too spammy and, like, that's even becoming a problem now, whereas you just mentioned yourself that that was essentially what you did and that really helped you. Um, yeah, and guest blogging, when Matt Cutts talks about guest blogging being too spammy, he basically means, like, the networks that are set up where people are giving each other guest blogs with basically no moderation. Guest blogging still absolutely 100% works mm. if, you, if you can get it on a blog that isn't in that business. So when I had my guest posts on blogs, they were on like shaving blogs who normally didn't take guest posts or maybe had one or two guest posting uh, or guest posts in the past, but they, were, they weren't in the business of SEO. They were just shaving blogs. So if you get a really high quality article on a high quality site it, in your niche, that still works for sure. Sure. Hard to do. Yeah. It takes time, but it still works. Right. I mean, you have to build that relationship, and I'm sure a lot of them may not even understand what it is you're really trying to accomplish with it. Right. Yep. It's totally true. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, like, you know, when you refer to more the white hat and the gray hat sort of tactics, the gray hat may be meaning, like, you know, you're buying some of these links, but you know, you're not going out there with, like, the latest SEO tool and cracking capture codes and, like, spamming these, like, comments all over people's blogs and stuff like that. Yeah, and mostly because that stuff is way too short, like, way too short term. And, yeah. like, if you have a website or a SEO website in any niche and you're keeping an eye on the SERPs, you'll see those black hat sites come and go all the time. So someone will shoot up to number one and they'll be there for a month and and they're going to drop out, you know. And right. to me, that's not worth it. I would rather have an asset that's going to earn me $30,000 over its lifetime than something that earns me 600 bucks and then I have to do it again, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it makes sense to do things the right way. And then when, the, when and if things do change, you know, you're going to have, you know, you're still going to be there up at the top ranks. You're not going to lose your rankings and um, you'll have quality content to boot, you know. Yeah, it's true. And it's really, you know, like there are so many different strategies. It's worth investigating what's good for your market. Spencer has a website, um, and I won't give away the niche, but he has a website that's kind of a hobby between his friend and himself, and they get about 500 visitors a day, and they have absolutely no links built, but they just have tons and tons of content. 
Um, and so it's the internal links and natural social sharing and like natural links that comes from just being a little bit popular mm. is, is what's helping the site grow. So there are just so many different strategies. What I prefer to do is kind of in the middle, you know, where sure. my sites really start earning money at about three months and then kind of hit their peak at about six months and then hopefully hold steady from there. Right. So now in terms of, um, I mean, you it sounds like you've kind of started on to build like other sites that probably won't be like really public case studies like the um, A Penny Shaved was. Yep. Um, I mean, how do you really go about like kind of the, the phase of like getting these started? Like if you want to start with this new site, I mean, do you just build a foundation, build out the design and the theme and then, um, you know, figure out obviously you got to do keyword research well before you've even started the site and then uh, you go on to do content. I mean, is there anything else... That you might be able to add, you know, once once you've really got this content out there, everything's built out. I mean, obviously at that point, I would think that's when you're going to start doing some of your link building and blog commenting things like that. Um, um, yeah, that's a process I've been trying to nail down for a while because I now manage Spencer's websites and we try to build one or two niche websites a month. You know, so mm -hmm. we are the process that we've kind of decided on is basically takes a month, um, and each website is going to take about 100 hours, you know, maybe a little bit less. Maybe wow. maybe less than, I mean, 100 hours if you're doing the writing yourself. I outsource all the writing, so it probably takes me more like 40 or so. Yeah, um, that's not bad. So basically what my process is now is I will do keyword research um, in like a day. And I don't think that's within everybody's skill set until you have a lot of practice at keyword research, but usually I do my keyword research in a day, so I'll find a primary keyword that I think is in a good market and can sell some products. Um, I like to find stuff that I think I can use for both Amazon and AdSense, and then I'll sure. find 15 or 30 secondary keywords, stuff that I can outsource immediately if I need to. So I'll usually do that in the first day, um, and then that first week I will write a couple articles and then after that, I will order all the links that can be ordered. So that is like any packages, press releases, outsourced blog comments, that type of thing. Um, and I'll also maybe put some directory links or research my competitions links. Um, and also in that second week, I will outsource all the rest of the content. So in these first two weeks, we have done keyword research. I wrote the primary articles. I've outsourced whatever links can be outsourced because I know those are going to take three weeks to come in anyway. Um, and I've outsourced the content. So in the next week, I'll build my first layer of PBN links. And then in the final week of the month, when all of the stuff that I ordered in like week one or two is finally starting to come in, I will write the most powerful links and sort of drip them out for the next month, which basically just means putting them on WordPress and scheduling them to be posted at some interval. So um, I'm not sure that's ideal, but it's kind of a, a necessity for the way we're doing business right now, which is making sure. one or two niche sites per month. So we're kind of going at a really fast pace. The second site that I've created personally, I've done over maybe two months, you know? Right. right. Um, and, I, and I did that kind of the same way I did a penny shade, which is I got all the content in order and posted that, and then I started worrying about links. So you can do them both ways. Do you find that, like, um, obviously, with you're building these sites, like, very quickly. I was curious um, when it comes to the PBN links. I mean, do you feel like that raises any red flags, like, even within a, you know, two- or three-week-old site to be throwing, like, these super high-authority links at it? Um, not if it's surrounded by a bunch of other links. And also, we, I'm part of a group that pools our PBN resources, so our PBN is fairly large. Um... But it's a really easy problem to solve even if you don't have those resources because you can just schedule the posts to show up at whatever times you want, you know, using WordPress's built-in scheduler. So instead of just throwing all the PBN links out, up at once, you can just have them scheduled to appear every other day for the next 10 days or something. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's what... Um that's kind of what I've been doing with um, with our network, just because you know there, <laughs> it doesn't make sense to like publish like a bunch of articles back to back. No one really does that in the real world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And I, you know, like I'm not as careful as some people because I don't think it matters too much. I think my site is usually so small that 
that Google doesn't particularly care, you know? So, I, I mean, right. the general rule of thumb I go by is that, like, 100 articles, I mean, 10 articles posted at once probably isn't a big deal to Google because you may have had a bunch of writers writing them. 100 articles posted at once probably is a big deal to Google, so it's just common sense, you know? But I, right. have, I have no problem publishing, you know, two or three or five articles at once. Sure. I mean, and ultimately, you know, you gotta. I try to look at things too. Like, you know, it's not like you're publishing like two sentences on a on a website and then trying yeah. to get something ranked. You know, you're actually yeah. legitimately creating a resource where if people were to go there and it happened to be about a particular product and they read that website, that they're going to learn something and then they should be enticed to buy based on what they've read. You know, a review or whatever the case. And Google tests those things, like Google test your bounce rate and test people's time on page and, and that sort of thing. They even have recently instituted like a sandbox or audition period for new sites, so they know. And I think they're a little bit more lenient for pages that they view as non-spammy, pages that people are spending time on, you know. Sure. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think that I, I've definitely read a lot about the bounce rate and affecting things like that as well, you know. Yeah. It's gotta have, I think it does have some weight for sure. Yeah, big time. But, um, yeah, I think we've covered a lot. I don't know if um, – I know I could easily have a whole conversation with you about that other software that you're going to be developing. The, I, I think it's like a gaming microphone, kind of like Ventrilo, TeamSpeak ordeal. Yeah, yeah basically Ventrilo and TeamSpeak, but inside your browser, so you don't have to download anything or buy a server. Yeah, yeah, that's actually pretty cool. I was um, – I was just playing Diablo 3 before we got on this call, oh, nice. and my friend was using Skype on his cell phone, and I'm, like, telling him he's got to get a microphone. But it would be nice to have something that, you know, like, I have so many people that seem to jump around between those services, and then the fact that you've really got to, like, pay for some of the hosting. I mean, if that's something you, you were able to overcome and set it up with this, I think you really have, like, a good product on your hands. Yeah, and it's... I mean, it's just a good business idea, I think. You know, like, the voice chat has been a glaring problem in the gaming industry for, like, a decade. Mm. Um, and nobody's really been able to solve it uh, until now because there's been some new software released by Firefox and Google called WebRTC that basically makes peer-to-peer -peer audio video transfer uh, free. And mm. it, it was very, very expensive before. So, or at least, like, inside your browser free. So, um, there's going to be a lot of players in this market, I think, but hopefully we'll be one of the first and one of the best because I think everybody sees the pain there, so. Sure. Yeah, I remember um, when I used to play Battlefield 3, I think I think they removed it, but they had a voice chat option inside the browser with uh -huh. their battle log, you know, like their whole battle log system that they had, the web browser based. Yeah game browser, yeah. but they, for whatever reason they removed it, I don't know why, but that yeah. seemed to work fairly well when I remember using it with, with friends, you know. Yeah, some games have it, some games don't. Usually um, the only people who can really afford to have it are like the major companies like Blizzard, you know. Sure, yeah. Um, think, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also if you stop playing that game and switch games, you have to stop chatting, which is kind of another benefit of having some external thing that you can be talking on. Right. Yeah. So we'll see how it goes. It's it's really exciting. We're just finishing up the design. Um, and I enjoy having an entrepreneurial pursuit outside of niche sites. So I'm doing really well with niche sites, and I'm making quite a bit of money with niche sites. But in the end, the downside of niche sites, unless you have an employee... Um, is that they're not scalable, you know? So, right. um, or they're not as scalable as other businesses. You can't just, I mean, because for any business, you kind of want a machine that, you know, eats quarters and poops dollars, and mm -hmm. then if you want more dollars, you just throw more quarters in, you know? And niche sites aren't like that. You have to build them one at a time, you know? So hopefully this would be a business that we can scale to something that's a little bit bigger, which would be cool. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think it. I think it's definitely a good idea. I mean, even with the niche sites, I mean, the way that the way that it's designed, even if you're building one after another, it's almost like very passive once it's going. Because now you, I mean, 
I, if you wanted to share with the audience like what kind of traffic numbers you had, I know, yeah. you know we're talking about all these things, but um, I think people would have a little bit better perspective of like really all these tactics that you've been following. Like, what are the results of that? You know? Yeah, for sure. So a penny shaved gets, um, let's see. So like January, I was between 800 and 1,000 visitors a month, and February I was getting about, I'm sorry, not a month, a day. In February I was getting about 1,100 daily, and now I'm getting about 1,600 daily. So, wow. um, And that's mostly because I had all the content written in January, and any keyword is going to take about three months to rank, and so all of the articles that I had written are maturing finally, and so those keywords are showing up in the SERPs. Um, as a comparison, I started a new site in January um, following basically that same formula, and now, like at the end of the March, it just started getting decent traffic, so it's about at about 200 visitors a day. So I expect that to keep increasing and um, maybe hit, you know, a thousand or so by May or something. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I mean, mainly you're—that's probably I'm assuming building out a lot of these articles around like secondary keywords, things that you know will actually get, you know, have a good chance and likelihood to actually rank in the right. top ten. Yeah, and I'm not super concerned about secondary keywords when I write an article. Um, I do some research and I see, I check to basically see that it's low competition, but in the end, you're going to end up ranking for thousands of secondary keywords that you didn't plan for. So, a penny shaved has 35 articles. I targeted, I targeted 35 keywords, but I'm ranking for 4,000 search terms. Wow. So, um, you know, as a site matures, lots of long tail keywords will start will start showing up in the search engines, which is where most of your traffic will come from. So for my primary keyword on a penny shade, I think I get a thousand visitors a month out of forty. So it's it's a very small percentage. Definitely something like ninety percent of my traffic comes from long tail keywords that I didn't even target. Right. You just wrote all these relevant it's basically people searching for I'm sure like all kinds of odd search terms that just happen to be related to the particular niche. Yep, that's totally right. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I see the same thing with my with my skull site. Like people typing in like specific, very specific items. Like you know, I would never write an article yeah. based around these keywords, but because they're searching for it, it's just very relevant to that particular thing. So yeah, and it's really easy to get caught up in finding some amazing keyword, but that's not where the traffic comes from. For my secondary site, I found a really great keyword that gets eight thousand searches a month, and I am number two for that keyword. Um, but I'm only getting two hundred searches a day. The site will really start making money when it matures as a whole, and I start ranking for hundreds of little long tail keywords that I never planned for. Sure. Hmm. Yeah, it's really, really great to, um, really great advice, I guess. You know, just in terms of, you know, like I've, I've always felt like, you know, like this huge goal is to get that one keyword to show up in the first ten, you know, top ten spots or whatever. But it seems like really the the majority of it is just going to come from this combination of people searching for all kinds of relevant information. Yeah, it's, a, and like when you put it all together, um, that's what makes the site successful. It's, you know, between fifteen and fifty really good articles on related content that have a strong link portfolio supporting them and just like letting that asset mature for several months and uh, kind of tweaking as you need to um, but yeah it's, it's it's not about finding one spectacular keyword it's about building an asset in a good market and then supporting it with just like solid best practice SEO awesome yeah, well, th thanks for that great advice. Um, I'm actually going to be starting on a new site myself, so this oh, nice. has been very helpful for me. Um, hopefully, I'll be outsourcing a lot of the content because I'm sort of, I think I'm a little, like the whole blogging thing has sort of burned me out over the last yeah. few years. Like, I like to do it every once in a while lately, but yeah. I have enough going on and some revenue coming in, so why not have someone else do it, you know? Yep, and you know, like, I feel like that's kind of the next move in entrepreneurship is like you do the really tactical stuff first but then when you do start making money your time is better spent 
um, managing, you know, like yeah. that's that's where you get the most value. So, I wish you all this all the success, man. I, uh, like, what what phase are you in? Uh, oh well, with this particular site, I um I know like we talked before we started. Um, a friend of mine, Matt Allen, does keyword research packages, and he basically goes out with Longtail Pro, and he'll create these really in depth reports. And um, because I've known him for a while, I interviewed him about a year ago. Um, he gives me a little bit of a discount on the keyword research package and he's basically doing all the research for me because he's been doing this for a very long time. He, you know, he's sold something like 20, 20 of these packages and um, I trust his, you know, his yeah. ability to pick out these keywords and yeah. pick a niche that, you know, I basically asked him for something very, specifically something very specific to what like you've done with a penny shaved mm -hmm. because you have this sort of base where you can write all these articles about something, you know, you know, I, I wanted something where I knew the content could, I could just keep cranking out content. Yeah. So yeah. I'm hoping, you know, I'm hoping it's not something I hate, but he's going to be picking it for me. And then, <laughs> you know, I'll have that keyword research done for probably, I'm guessing around a hundred dollars. Yeah. And then from there I'll probably build out the site, you know, use a theme. And um, I already have a plugin I mentioned earlier called Pro Associate. And that actually takes all of the product descriptions and reviews and everything off of Amazon and makes like a very seamless like e-commerce store. Yeah. Um, and that's a really awesome plugin. Those guys have been adapting it the last year, and it's um, it works very well. Um, the only problem is if the product stops being sold on Amazon, then the plugin sort of like breaks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For that particular item, so that's not really a good thing. Like, whereas you're probably manually putting in links. Like, I don't have to. I could basically build a site with that particular plugin. You know, I could put up 700. I could literally go search and just check boxes on every product I found in the search, and it will import them and put them on the site with full descriptions, fully yeah. SEO'd based on the product descriptions and titles. And I don't have to do any other work. Right. Um, right. Yeah. So I mean, there's some. Obviously, it's nicer to like fix them and make them nicer. But I'm not like manually going on Amazon and like shortening links and like doing other things with other tools. So for sure, for that sure. saves a lot of time. And then um, probably just from there, I'm assuming building out the content, like going crazy with the content, maybe like 20 to 30 articles, and then yeah. go and um, start kind of doing the same thing. I, I um. People, hopefully, by the time they've listened to this, will know that I'm also running my own PBN service, so maybe doing some of my own PBN links from that service as well as, um, you know, maybe even picking up some links from other services. Yeah, totally, totally. So, awesome, yeah. man. Well, I, hope, I hope it goes well. Yeah. Well, um, I think we've covered a lot. I know we're, like, I think we're at, like, the 50-minute mark here. Nice. Um, <laughs> so I'll probably let you go. I haven't eaten dinner yet. I'm starving, right. so. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I really appreciate you taking the time on your Friday night to talk with me, and I hope, um, you know, for anyone listening, you know, Spencer's fans or even my fans, that this was really informative. Yeah, thanks for having me on, and, um, you know, everybody go check out Niche Pursuits. Okay. Talk to you later. All right. See you later.